Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Sunday morning worship gathering uh, of Olivet Baptist Church. We welcome you on this cold morning. And uh, if you're a guest in our midst, we especially want to welcome you this morning. We would invite you at some point in, in our worship gathering, we would invite you to take one of those connect cards on the pew in front of you. Shouldn't take you much time at all to fill out. And before you head out, you can just take that connect card and put it in our offering box there. Uh, we'd love just to know that you were here and our elders, every time we gather for our elder meeting, we will take time to pray for our guests. And specifically, if there's any specific way we can pray for you, you can just flip on the back of that connect card and we will pray for you specifically. Uh, announcements wise, let me give you four announcements, Olivet. Obviously, there's more than that. It's uh, proverbially, it's in the bulletin, it's in the email, the rest of it. First off, many of you may know by now that it was th about a week ago today, about 9.15, last Sunday, 9.15, Lloyd Hurst, one of our members, one of our deacons, Lloyd Hurst had a heart attack in his home. And so he has been, he's been in the hospital this week. They put in a couple of stints. He is now back home. Uh, and recovering well, but then I think it was just yesterday, Polly, Lloyd's wife, uh, Polly's sister, they found her sister dead in her apartment. So it has been quite the week for the Hearst family. So if you know Lloyd and Polly, especially if you're a member of our faith family, uh, we have covenanted together to, to take care of one another, to bear one, of the, uh, one another's burdens. And so I think there's a meal train that's already been put together for the Hearst family. Obviously be praying for the Hearst family um, and just pray and ask the Lord how you might best be an encouragement to them in this time. Maybe it's a meal, maybe it's a phone call, maybe it's a visit just to go hug them and pray with them. But uh, just wanted, to, wanted you to be updated on the Hearst family. Ladies, the women's video Bible study will officially start tonight at 6.30. I believe that's in conference room two here tonight. Everybody's invited for that. And then if you're, if you're a guest and maybe you've been a guest for some time and you're interested in joining our church or you're interested in learning more about our church, we're going to be having our next new member class slash dinner on Friday, March the 1st. And so that's going to be from 6 o'clock. We usually try to make it 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock. Child care is provided and free. We will provide Medi's, uh, Medi's entrees and Chick-fil-A desserts for you just to kind of whet your appetite and get you there as well. And uh, that is a requirement. If you want to become a member of our church, we do require you to come to the class as kind of step one in that process. And so you can sign up using the QR code on the bulletin, or you can go to our website and sign up that way. Lastly, I want to remind you also, if you're a guest, I want to remind you that we have discipleship groups that meet throughout the week. They are men's, they're gender specific. So five to seven men meeting together weekly, five to seven women meeting together weekly, early mornings, late evenings, there's all kinds of options. And so if you're a guest in our midst, or especially if you're a member, but you've never become a part of a discipleship group, those are not closed groups. And so it being January and the start of a new year, we know this is a good time. Some of you, maybe you've been feeling the tug to get more involved or to get more involved relationally, knowing people, or with the start of the new year, you've just been, you felt led to get more serious about your faith and you want some accountability in that. Let me just remind you, discipleship groups are a wonderful avenue for that. You can talk to Thomas, uh, our associate pastor about that, or you can, uh, yeah, his email is right there. And there's also a sign-up thing online for that, okay? We'd love for you to be a part of that. Let's, uh, let's stand up together, and let's officially start our worship gathering with the call to worship reading. The call to worship this morning is Exodus 15, verse 2. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him my father's God, and I will exalt him. Pray with me. Oh, Father, we thank you. We thank you that you call us to worship you. We thank you that you provide the way for us. And Father, I thank you especially that you are our strength, our song, and our salvation. And this morning, as we hear the word taught, and we sing to you, and we pray, May we exalt you and lift you up. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise is 
Bless the Lord, O oh you, his angels, you might, mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my God. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before. 
Before I pray this morning, I simply want to call your attention to a request that Kyle and Kathy uh, in Central and South Asia have uh, made of us. They would like for people to join them at 10.02 every day to pray for workers in the harvest field. Luke 10, uh, Luke 10.2 says, the, the fields are white under harvest. Pray that God will send out more workers in the harvest field. So I encourage you, if you get that, that uh, email from them weekly, that you would mark on your, on your phone. Uh, mine went off at 10.02 this morning, just as Matthew was starting to make announcements and standing in the back. I prayed for workers in the harvest field. So let me encourage you to do that. Join with me as we pray this morning. <coughs> Fathers, King David prayed for the people of Israel in Psalm 20. I lift up the people who call themselves Olivet Baptist Church. I pray that you, Lord, would answer us in the day of our troubles, that we would find strength and joy through your presence, that the name of the God of Jacob would protect us as we walk in obedience to you, that you, O oh God, would send us help and strength, and, and strength from your sanctuary and support your people who are called by your name. I ask you to remember our offerings and gifts that come to us first from your hands. We return them to you in gratitude and obedience. I ask that you grant us the desires that you have planted in our hearts for the glory of your name. 
that our desires would always reflect your honor and your glory. Give us great joy in the salvation you have provided through your son Jesus, who carried our sins and their punishments to the cross so that we could receive his righteousness. As some place your faith and trust in the things of this world, may we be known as people who trust in the name of the Lord our God. This morning, Father, we lift, lift up Lloyd and Polly as Lloyd recuperates from heart procedures and Polly deals with the sudden and unexpected death of her sister. May they find joy and peace in your faithful presence. We lift up the work of the Good Neighbor Centers. They faithfully serve families in our community with food, but especially as they share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. Thank you for all those who invest time and energy and funds to make this ministry possible. In just a couple of weeks, many of our women uh, will be setting aside time to gather at the women's retreat. We ask you to prepare their hearts for what they will hear and use the speaker, Susan Heck, to minister your word faithfully to them. We ask you to continue to use the, the, the discipleship groups that meet throughout the week. May the men and women involved in them grow deeper in their love for you and in their daily walks. May your spirit continue to teach their hearts with the beauty and strength of your word. May those who have not yet committed to be part of one of these groups sense your spirit's leadership to join with others to deepen their walk and faith in you. We pray this morning, Father, for those who have placed, you've placed in our lives who are far from you. Use us, we pray, to speak the truth to them and for the Holy Spirit to draw their hearts to you in repentance and belief. We lift up our sister churches in, in the area this morning as they meet to proclaim your word. We pray for Tyler Road Baptist and Pastor Brian Jones, for Country Acres Baptist and Pastor Kelly Randolph, and Believers Baptist with Pastor Tim Olds. We continue to pray for those whom you sent from us to serve you in difficult and dark places around the world. For Chad and Deanna in Central Asia, Kyle and Kathy in South Asia, Keith and Julie in the Middle East and North Africa, Nathan and Amy in South Asia. We ask you to proclaim the good news of Jesus through their lives and their testimonies and use them, we pray, to speak light into darkness, hope into despair, and joy into sorrow. And we do ask you, Father, to raise up more laborers to walk alongside them. We ask this morning, Father, for you to speak the word boldly through Thomas. May you draw our hearts more closely to yours, and may those in our midst who are far from you be drawn into the light of the glory of God in the face of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. If you are able to, we'd invite you to stand as we sing this last song and prepare our hearts to hear the word of the Lord this morning. Amen. 
You guys can go ahead and be seated. We will be in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Chapter 4. have it, say amen. If you need me to hold on, say, hey, hold on. Okay. We're going to be looking at verses 6 through 21. As always, this is the most important thing that I will say today. This is God's word, beginning with verse 6. Paul says, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against the other. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all that you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings. And would that you did reign so that we might share in the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us as apostles last of all, like men sentenced to death because we have become a spectacle to the world to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you, you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. Verse 11. To this present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor working with our hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. 14. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you, then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant as if though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills. And I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? Pray with me. Father, you lead the humble in what is right. God, you teach the humble your ways. Lord, we ask that today. Spirit, we need your help. Help us see ourselves rightly in light of your word. God, we ask that you would, as we preach and listen, that you would dismantle our pride by making us more into the image of your holy son. Make us more like Christ today, Lord. We ask this. We ask that you would sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Okay. So this is a pretty big piece of scripture, um, but it's not a difficult one if you were able to kind of see it. It's not that hard. Personally, I found this passage pretty enjoyable, pretty exciting to study, especially if you try to put yourself in Paul's footsteps, because as you would imagine Paul writing this and as you read it out loud, you can sense some of his love and some of his frustration that he's writing down. Or even when you read this, you can put yourself in Timothy's uh, shoes. Because more than likely, Timothy would have been the one who would have received this letter and he would have presented it to the church. So imagine little Timothy coming to the Corinthian church and reading a letter like this out loud. Yeah. Every, especially in this section, if you notice this section is just filled with with passion and sarcasm and irony. Paul gets emotional, he gets authoritative, then he gets a little fatherly here. But even throughout the different tones here, we really just have two big points in this entire section. So two points for us today. Point number one, we're going to see a striking contrast. That's going to be verses 6 through 13. And then point number two, we're going to look at a loving command from Paul. Verses 14 through 21. A striking contrast and a loving command here. Point number one, we see this contrast mostly noticeable uh, as, as Paul continues to drive this massive wedge between the apostles' humility and the Corinthian pride. We see that in verse 6. Look at verse 6. 
He says, I have applied all of these things, so everything from chapter 1 through 4 to now, uh, to myself and to Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. I like that word, puffed up. I think the ESV translates this perfectly. Some of your translations may say uh, arrogant or, or proud. They are all the same Greek word here. He uses puffed up. I like the word because it gives you the picture of a balloon kind of being blown up. So it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually it just pops. I think this is a perfect descriptor of the Corinthian church and of the Corinthian culture. Now I want you to notice something. Notice how he begins it, speaking of their puffed upness, and then how he ends it. Look at verse 18. Verse 18 says, Paul says, some of you here are arrogant. That's the puffed up word, arrogant. As though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. And I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. So he ends the section the same way that he begins it, by speaking of their proud, pridefulness, by speaking of their arrogance. They have a pride problem. Uh, if you ever had a, I'm sure you guys have, a, a basketball or, or a football, and then it's just too aired up, it doesn't bounce quite right, right? What do you do? When you grab the little uh, pump, take the needle out, and you put the needle in, and then you put the needle in, and the air comes out. And you ever hear that noise, that little noise? I did this yesterday to make sure I heard, I heard the noise. I heard the noise. It's satisfying noise, right? It's deflating it. That noise is exactly what Paul is doing here in this section. He, he, he is doing that in our text. He is deflating this puffed up, swollen, big-headed, prideful church. He's trying to bring them back to humility. Paul punctures this inflated view that they have of themselves, and he does it by asking three questions. These three questions, you just hear it. You go, as you ask the three questions, look. He asks the who, the what, and the why. Who, what, why. Look at verse 7. He says, For who sees anything different in you? This is negative. A literal translation would be more like, Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Next question. What do you have that you did not receive? Next question. If then you received it, exactly. If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? I love this because we know that questions make a difference. The right questions make a difference. And in verse 7, we have this divinely inspired string of words, divinely designed questions that are used to knock the wind out of any puffed up church member. They are designed to deflate the ego out of any arrogant member in the Corinthian church and in our church today. These questions, I would consider them a gift from God. They are used for the purpose of humbling us and bringing us closer to Jesus. Look at the first two questions again. Who do you think you are? What do you have that you did not receive? I think we as Christians, we understand this text more than anyone else, do we not? Answer it. What do you have that you did not receive? Nothing. Nothing. Christians should know better. Everything that we have is a gift from God. Everything from our health to our possessions, even the breath that we have in our lungs, it is a gift from God. Even just think about the thing that you prize the most. What is it? Salvation? It's a gift from God. You see, these three questions, they really summarize Pauline theology. It is by grace alone. Ephesians 2 verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, because if it was of your own doing, this would not have been a gift of God, but it's not of your own doing, therefore it is a gift of God. Not a result of works, because if it was a result of works, then you could boast, but it's not a result of works so that no one may boast. The Corinthians here, they have a boasting problem. Look at question three. If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? I read these three questions and immediately think, this should humble us. It should humble them. But just in case it doesn't, Paul continues. He continues to humble them. He has these three humbling rhetorical questions that are used to reveal the pride of the Corinthians. And now he has these three sarcastic statements that are used to drive this wedge deeper between the, the apostles' humility and the Corinthian pride. Look at verse 8. I love it. 
He's sarcastic. He says, already you have all that you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you guys have become kings. Paul says, man, you guys are royals. You guys have no lack. You guys are filthy rich. You don't need us. You're doing pretty well over there. You have no needs. You are on thrones. This is triumphal language. You'll see it throughout this entire section. He continues. He says in verse 10, he says, man, we, we are fools for Christ's sake. But you, Corinthians, man, you are wise. You are wise. We, man, we're weak. We're frail. You, you are strong. You are honorable. You are worthy. You are respected. But we, apostles, man, we're in disgrace. We're tarnished. Do you see the contrast that he's trying to make? You see the sarcasm just dripping off his tongue? You see, the, the Corinthians, they, they think so highly of themselves. So, so Paul is, is, is elevating them that to the status that they want to be elevated to. He says, man, you guys are awesome. You guys are great. You guys are kings. You have all that you want. You're rich. We're poor. You guys are so amazing. The Corinthians are proud. Back in Texas, we, we, we call this, uh, we, we would say, they think their poop don't stink, right? That's what they think. That's what, they're a bunch of bobbleheads walking around, sitting in the pew. Their head is too inflated. It doesn't fit their body. Now contrast that with the apostles. Look at verse 9. He says, For I think that God has exhibited us as apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. So we have these three rhetorical questions. Now we have these three sarcastic statements that are used to humble the Corinthians. And now we see these three descriptors of the apostles. You see what he says here? He says they are last of all, sentenced to death, and a spectacle to the world. Paul continues with this triumphal type language. And he's using that in describing the humility of the apostles. Because if you look at verse 9, verse 9 basically paints this picture of these Corinthians sitting on thrones. But the apostles... They're Roman spectacles, meaning their lives are used for the enjoyment of the people. This is a picture of people who are being carted into the Colosseum and are about to be devoured by wild animals. That's what it means to be a Roman spectacle. The first century Roman context, they would have read this and immediately thought about a Roman triumph. You guys know what that is? It's basically a public ceremony or a parade that's used to celebrate the successes of a military commander after conquering a people group or a city. So I'm, I'm sure if I explain it, you, you, you've seen this plenty of times in movies. So at the front of the parade, you have the commander who is basically treated as the, the, the emperor for the day, right? He's clothed in purple. He's filled with, with gold. He has a throne. There's chariots around him. And then behind him, you have just tons of wagons that are filled with gold and silver and valuables, basically everything that they plundered. And then right behind them would be some of these surviving military men, your generals, your different types of commanders. Then behind them, you would have the prisoners that they took in, people who are now going to become slaves. And then at the very end, behind them, you would have the people who they are going to make a spectacle out of. These would be sometimes your stronger men who are put into shackles. They would be brought into the city just to be humiliated and killed. Whether it's by the mouth of a lion or in a gladiator fight, they were to die for the pure pleasure of, of people watching for Rome's enjoyment. So what we see in this text, Paul is saying, hey, us apostles, we're the guys at the back of the line. We're the guys in the end of the line. We are the last of all. We are sentenced to death, and all of you are going to see that this is actually for your benefit, brothers. It's a striking contrast that he puts between these two people groups, between the apostles and the Corinthians. Now, I love verse 9 for you English nerds. Look at verse 9. Verse 9 What's the subject of verse 9? It's God. God is. Meaning that it is God's doing. So Paul is, Paul's humility, he is crediting that to God's actions. Saying God is doing this. He doesn't say that about the Corinthians. He's reminding here the Corinthians that their clout chasing status is their own doing. This is not God's doing. This is your doing. So he goes from rhetorical to sarcastic. And now my favorite, he gets a little emotional. He gets a little frustrated with them. Put your eyes on verse 11. Verse 10, he continues, we are fools, 
you are wise. We are weak, you are strong. Now notice the change in tone in verse 11. To this present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. We labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Paul here is driving this wedge deeper and deeper and deeper. Now the ironic thing about all of this is that the Corinthian pride, remember how it's played out? It's played out in showing favoritism to their leaders. They're saying, I follow Paul, I follow Peter, I follow Apollos. So now Paul here is saying, do you really? Do you really follow us? Because it seems like you guys are too great to follow us. If you follow us, someone is in the wrong order in this Roman triumph. Because you guys are way too kingly to follow us spectacle. So do you really follow us? Because if you follow us, look at where we're at. We're hungry, we're thirsty, we have to work with our hands, we are poor, we wear rags, we are battered. We're constantly being beaten. And when we're beaten, guess what we do? We bless. When we're persecuted, we endure. We're, we are the undesirables of, this, of the world. Scum, that's what it is. You guys, you Corinthians, man, you're nothing like us. Now here's the thing. Here's the thing about following people, and you know this. If you follow someone, eventually you will become like them. And it's clear and it's evident that the Corinthians here are not acting like they are following Paul. They're not acting like they're following Apollos or even Peter at them, uh, even Jesus. They don't even look like they're following Jesus. I simply think that it's, it's not, it's not a, a too much to ask for when we tell Christians to act like Christians. I think that's what Paul is doing here. As Paul contrasts this Corinthian pride with the apostles' humility, think about it. Which one of them gives most evidence to who is following Christ? Of course, the apostles, no brainer. Paul's life here is an example for our life because he was an example of Jesus' life. Later on in the book, you'll see that Paul says, hey, follow me as I follow Christ. And I like to think that Paul followed Jesus pretty well, didn't he? I think he did. I think you actually see it in this text. Look at verse 9 with me again. Like men sentenced to death because we have become a spectacle to the world. Do you know who else is a man who was sentenced to death for the whole world to see? Jesus, his Lord. Or verse 11. To this present hour we hunger and thirst. Do you know who else hungered and thirst? Jesus, his Lord. He continues, we are poorly dressed buffeted and homeless. Do you know who said that foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head? Jesus. Jesus also labored with his hands. Jesus was reviled, mocked, beaten, tortured beyond recognition, and slain dead. And instead of cursing his oppressors, what does he say? And Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You see, as we look to Paul, and Paul describing himself, as we, look, as we look to Paul, we can't help but to see Jesus. And we can't help but to be reminded of the gospel, of, of the good news that Jesus has endured the entire, the full wrath of God. The good news that Jesus has been judged with the judgment that we deserve. The good news that Jesus has suffered, died, and rose from the dead so that we may be blessed and live. Church, don't lose sight of this. Don't lose sight of the gospel because in the gospel we see that Jesus is the ultimate example of humility. Paul later writes in Philippians chapter 2, he says, Jesus, who though was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Paul looks a lot like Jesus. And I think this leads to my next point. Point number two, verses 14 through 21. We see a loving command, and that command is to imitate Paul. Look at verse 14 again. Verse 14. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. In other words, Paul is saying, hey, I'm not writing for your pity. I'm not doing the victim card. That's a new thing, by the way. I'm not doing that. Rather, 
I'm warning you and I'm rebuking you as a loving father. Look at verse 15. It says, for though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. Ain't that the truth? For though you have countless guides, you do not have many fathers. If there is ever a verse in the Bible that we can just pluck it even out of context and just put into our church, this is that verse. This is that verse. Because we, as Christians in 2024, we have countless guides. We have, some translations say, tens of thousands of guides. We have that. We have many things that are pulling toward us or us toward them. We have many influencers. We have many podcasts, many people that we hold dear to. We have many people that we enjoy listening to. We have many guides. Heck, we have many role models, don't we? We don't need guides. We need spiritual fathers. We need spiritual mothers. That's what we need. Social media is not a father or a mother. The preacher that we love to listen to, he is not a spiritual father on YouTube. The author of whose books we just continue to devour, that is not a spiritual father or mother. Corinthians, that orator that can woo you into liking them, that is not a father or a mother. That sophist that, that tickles your intellect, that is not a father or mother. And who is? Verse 15, Paul says, For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. There's our loving fatherly command to be imitators of Paul. Imitate Paul. Verse 17. He says, That's actually why I sent Timothy to you, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. I know I said the last section was my favorite because he was emotional and authoritative. Nah, I think this section is actually my favorite. Because here, you see Paul just become fatherly and loving. See, Paul, when it comes to the Corinthian church, he doesn't hate them. He has a sense of ownership with them. He's someone like a father, it says. Someone who was there at their birth and walked with them for a year and a half before he was forced to leave out. If you're familiar with the story in Acts chapter 18, just read it. You'll see it there. I think that's why in verse 18, Paul is just laying it out. He's saying, hey, I wish to be with you. I, I want to be with you. I want to see you face to face. And I hope to come to you soon. I pray that the Lord wills that he would allow me to come see you. But I can't right now. So I'm sending Timothy. My child in the faith, the one who had no spiritual father and I became his father. I am sending what it says, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord to you. I am sending him because I can't go. I am sending him because Timothy has imitated me. And when you see Timothy, you will see me. When you hear Timothy speak, it will be as if I was speaking. He will show you the ways of Christ because I have shown him the ways of Christ. So imitate me. I'm sending you Timothy so that you can imitate him. This is a heartfelt plea. I mean, for, for us, it, it's a loving command to repent and to imitate Paul. This is a command that can be used for us this morning. Church, imitate Paul, imitate Timothy. Better yet, because some of you might say, well, they're dead. They are. Imitate the godly and wise in your church. Those who give us a good model of humility. Look for these fathers and mothers who God has placed among us, among our flock. Be proactive in, in spotting these people and be intentional when you find them. Say things like, hey, I see that you parent this way. I think that is a God-honoring way. Do you mind teaching me how to do that? Do you mind getting with me and showing me how to do this? Or you could even say something like, hey, I notice how you love your wife. I notice how you love her. I want to love my wife just like that. I find that hard. Do you mind meeting with me and helping me out? Or even, it can be simple. Hey, I see that you love Jesus. You love his bride. Can we get together a few times throughout the year just so that I can ask you questions? Or better yet, j just so that I can be around you? Can we do that? Be proactive because we have countless guides, but we don't have many fathers. We don't have many mothers. And for the health of our church and the sanctification of you, we need spiritual mothers. We need spiritual fathers. So one, man, be proactive. Be proactive and intentional in spotting these people. And two, be this person. Be this person. Be the Paul and Timothy of Olivet Baptist Church. Those who are younger in the faith need you. The immature need the mature. Be the type of spiritual parent that you wish you had. You can do that. I pray that God would raise up many 
spiritual fathers and mothers in our church. I think he's doing that right now. I think we have plenty, and I think he's raising some up too, and praise God for that. Paul ends this section with what I think is another humbling, rhetorical, sarcastic, Paul-like question. Look at verse 21. It says, And what do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? That's pretty fatherly. Do you want the spanking or do you want the hug? I'll speak on our behalf. We want the hug, don't we? Yeah. Pray with me. Father, we, we ask that your spirit would grow us in humility. That you would deflate our puffed up egos. That you would deflate our pride. That you would make us more and more and more like Jesus. Less like the world. Less like the culture. Father, thank you for the examples that we have in scripture. Thank you for Paul and Timothy. Now, God, we, we ask that you would give us, give all of it, these kind of spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers. For our good and for your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can go ahead and stand.
Well, Olivet, thank you for being here today. We, uh, as many of you know, we are short. Uh, Tis the season for sickness. And uh, so I hope you stay well as you go into this week. And uh, Olivet, if you see a visitor around you or somebody that looks new, uh, you just reach out a hand and uh, just welcome them in the name of Jesus Christ. And as you go out into this week, Olivet, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. You are dismissed.